Woo! Happy Thanksgiving, everybody! Techie 101 here, back again to talk about One Piece Chapter 1099! You know, it's crazy with everything happening as of late, what with Kuma's very uplifting backstory and all, I completely forgot we're getting close to Chapter 1100. What's gonna happen at Chapter 1100? I don't know, it's probably not going to be as much of a big deal as Chapter 1000 was. Honestly, Chapter 1000 wasn't even really that crazy. Uh, I mean, it was cool. Luffy showed up and, like, punched Kaido, but it wasn't, like, you know, anything that, like, changed the very shape of the story. Uh, a lot of people have said because Dragon showed up at Chapter 100 of One Piece, that uh, Dragon will show up at Chapter 1100 of One Piece. Kind of not that big of a deal because he showed up quite a few times during this flashback, but who knows? Maybe next chapter the flashback will end and Dragon will show up on Egghead. That, that would actually be a twist. That would be pretty damn cool. If, like, oh no, what's gonna happen? Kizaru's there, Saturn's there, he's crushing Bonnie, the other Straw Hats can't really do much, Cypher Pole is there, and then all of a sudden they're saving Grace, the person that's gonna save the day is Luffy's father, Monkey D. Dragon. And Luffy might be, like, unconscious, so he might not even see his dad, but then Dragon rocks up and just sends a freaking typhoon to, like, save the day or something, get Vegapunk and the Straw Hats out of there. Who knows? Who knows? Dragon has done it before. He's, like, done that kind of thing to save Luffy and the Straw Hats, so maybe it'll happen again. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. That'll be next week. Right now is chapter 1099, titled pacifist. Oh, pacifist. I get it. Kind of like pacifista. Oh, that's the origin of that word. Okay, now that makes sense now. That makes sense. Oh, we're good. We're good. This is, this is Oda explaining his story. This is great. This is world building now. Okay. Uh, the cover page is pretty cool. It's just Odin hanging out with a bunch of tanuki, and they're sitting on his hair. They're actually styling his hair into, like, a building. That's, that's kind of cool, because Odin had very interesting, like, that, like, the plate hair. So, yeah, that's, that's neat. Anyway, so we continue right where we left off last chapter. I'll do a little bit of a recap, because we jumped around a lot last time. There was a lot of time skips, okay? Uh, Bonnie was stricken with the sapphire scales, same disease that her mother had. Kuma did not, you know, know what the disease was. Every other doctor on the island didn't know what it was. Eventually, there was a doctor that showed up and was, like, diagnosing her with the, uh, okay, it's sapphire scale. Uh, we haven't really seen this condition in a while. There's no known cure. Uh, you know, if she's in any kind of natural light, so sunlight or moonlight, the scales on her body will, you know, encroach on the rest of her and eventually will kill her. Now, even though Kuma was keeping her inside of the church, away from the light, uh, the doctor still says, well, it's a genetic disease. It'll still kill her no matter what. Uh, she'll be lucky if she lives past her 10th birthday, and, and Bonnie was five at the time. Now, Bonnie overheard Kuma talking about this and the doctor and assumed that when she's 10, that means the disease will be cured. Okay, like, oh, this will all be over when I'm 10. Great, fantastic. Then we'll travel the world together, Dad. You know, and Kuma's like, yeah, that's true, buddy. Yeah, we'll travel the world. I hear there's so many crazy islands out there. And there I, I hear there's a place that where bubbles come out of the ground and candy grows on trees. And we, we, can, we can go there, yeah. So um, Kuma is now on a little bit of a clock. He has to figure out a way to uh, cure the sapphire scale. Not an easy task within five years. But at the very end of the last chapter, like the last panel, we actually cut forward a year. So Bonnie is now six, okay? So this is now, um, this would be five years ago, no, six years ago, six years ago from the present story. Uh, actually, same year, Shanks became an emperor is when this is happening right now. So a lot of crazy stuff happening six years ago, okay? But anyway, the chapter ended with the old folks showing up at Kuma's church uh, and being like, oh, Kuma, you need to help us. It's awful. Old King Bakori has returned to this island. He, he won't stop until every Every man, woman, and child over the age of 70 is dead! Yeah, I guess that last part didn't make any sense, but still, you need to help us. All right, so King Bakori was the former king of Sorbet. Uh, 22 years ago, he's the one that sliced the island in half, and uh, you know, me metaphorically, he like drew a like a territory line. He didn't like cut the island in half with like a laser. They, he doesn't have that. But um, yeah, he was like, oh, we're just gonna sever this island's dead weight. And then Kuma attempted to fight back against the royal army. Uh, he got thrown in jail. Ginny and 
some other people tried to get him back. They also got thrown in jail. And then eventually Dragon showed up. And I thought Dragon just killed Bakori, right? Because Dragon, this was in his Freedom Fighter days. This is where Dragon was not as compassionate as he has right now, right? But no, apparently Bakori was able just to grab his shit, take some of his royal guard, and get out of here. Very, very similar to Wapple. I'm, I'm seeing similarities here, definitely. Although, King Bakori, if nothing else, is more dedicated than Wapple, all right? And I'm assuming he came back, maybe, I, I don't know if he came back just in the last chapter, like just when the old folks were just like, oh, he's back again, or if he was there for a little while before that. Well, at any rate, King Bakori is back in charge. He's at the castle ruling over Sorbet. And uh, he's up there, and he's essentially torched the entire lower half of the island now. Uh, it, it's no longer just like, oh, we're just gonna, you know, draw this territory line, and that's the lawless land, and then this is, you know, the, uh, the proper Sorbet kingdom. No, we're just gonna burn it all. And he's up there on top of the castle with his royal guard, and he's like, mm, yes, uh, I have uh, heard about this policy of uh, burning half of your island down. Yes, there's a kingdom in the far east that did this a few years back. It was a splendid success. The celestial dragons praised them. I decided to try it myself here in the south. So King Bakori is uh, referring to Goa Kingdom and the burning of the Grey Terminal. So you had the Goa Kingdom where Luffy, Ace, and Sabo grew up. Uh, Sabo actually being a child of nobility, uh, not the king. For a while there, I thought Sabo was the child of the king of Goa. We actually do see the king of the Goa Kingdom, but only like his uh, lower face uh, when he was asleep in bed. Like this is the king of Goa. They decided, oh, okay, we, we're gonna shove all of our trash and on top of actual trash like junk we're also gonna shove all of the poor people out into um, this junkyard on the outskirts of the town outside of the walls and that's gonna be uh, like where they're gonna live and that was the gray terminal okay and so uh, as a celestial dragon was about to arrive at Goa that was Saint Jalmac uh, you know that they decided oh okay well we have to make sure this trash pile is destroyed by the time he gets here so they decided to burn it and a lot of people died from this uh, dragon did arrive and saved a lot of them including including Sabo along the way. Uh, this ties back into Luffy and Ace's backstory in the post-war arc and everything like that. But apparently, um, yeah, the Celestial Dragon, apparently Jao Mac was very impressed, though. He's like, oh, yes, the Goa Kingdom. Oh, it's been a while since I've been back. Oh, hey, what's that fog of smoke over there? Ah, yes, well, you see, St. Jao Mac, uh, we burned an entire pile of trash with people living in it last night. Ah! You know what? Good job! Good job! You know, the other Celestial Dragons would be proud. I'm actually rather impressed. That's pretty nice. I would not- No, St. Jalmac is like, I will give you a single clap of approval. And then all of the Goa Kingdom, all of the royalty are like, ah, oh, ah, And then Jalmac is like, dun, 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 dun. Oh, we got the praise of the Celestial Dragons! Woo! Yeah, so there, that's how that goes. So Bakori was like, oh yes, that worked for them. Let's just do this here. So yeah, they're burning the uh, entire area down leaving a spotless, beautiful city. One must have the heart to do the devil's work, after all. That's what it truly means to be a king in the One Piece world. It, it really is a messed up thing on the morality scale where, yeah, the more messed up you are as an individual when you're ruling a kingdom, the more cutthroat that you are, the more praise you're gonna get from the Celestial Dragons because their sense of morality is essentially perfectly flipped, okay? So if you go to the Celestial Dragons and be like, you know, during reverie or something, and you'd be like, hey, yes, um, all the people in our island, uh, you know, that, that were poor and living on the outskirts, we, we murdered them all. We, we just sent a roving band of mercenaries to cut their throats in their sleep. The Celestial Dragons are gonna get a hard-on from that, man. They're gonna be like, oh, pfft, nice, you know? So, and that's how you literally make it up the, the ladder in the One Piece world. You wanna go places? That's the kind of shit they like. Oh, God. So, anyway, um, Kuma charges into the burning town and uses his paw paw powers to get as many people out as possible, okay? So he's charging into burning building after burning building, and he's himself being very reckless. He's on fire. The uh, the citizens on the outskirts of the town are watching Kuma do this, and he's just like, Kuma Chi, please, you can't save anyone else. You've done enough. Please stop. And Kuma's like, no, I gotta save everybody. And so he's charging into, you know, houses and sending people away. Um, 
we cut to the royal capital where obviously there's a bunch of people protesting outside of the castle. You know, King Bakori, please stop burning our towns down. And the king is just like, nah. Yes, I, I, I predicted there would be a little bit of backlash from this. Um, yeah, shoot like four or five of them. That should probably send a message. And the royal guards are just like, yeah, all right. I mean, this is the guy that pays us, so I suppose. <laughs> They're just like, all right. So they shoot a bunch of random people in the crowd. And um, that's when Kuma shows up. I mean, Kuma's basically Superman here, except an extraordinarily pissed off, angry Superman, okay? Uh, he just lands and it's just like, Ugh. And so, um, <laughs> all right. So uh, Bakori should be shitting in his pants about now. Uh, this should be a moment. Uh, all of the injured people that got shot from Bakori's Royal Guard, they get sent to Kuma's church. Uh, and so the old folks are like, oh, we got to make sure they're okay. Bonnie's waiting at the door, looking up at the castle where Kuma flew off to fight. And uh, she's there in the doorway and the, the old folks are watching Bonnie. And they're like, Bonnie, dear, please stay away from the door. You can't get any light on you. And Bonnie's just looking up at the castle like, Dad, um, I've never seen him this pissed off before. Is this going to be a problem? You know, it, it's okay, honey. It's okay, Bonnie. Your dad is going to wring the life out of King Bakuri once and for all. Come inside, dear. <laughs> it's just like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, um... There's this overall, like, as Bakori is, like, pleading for his life, as Kuma is, like, Terminator stomping towards him, before he's actually a Terminator, in fact. Uh, don't you dare attack me now, Kuma, you stupid bumpkin of a priest! You know, you, you, if you attack a king, some major consequences will be for you, yeah, so make, make, make sure you just go back to your pitiful, tiny little church out in the middle of nowhere and, and praise your, 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 uh, I don't know what you actually worship, I don't really care. I just worship money for I am King Bakori. And so, um, yeah, that's when Kuma just Ursa shock, just boom, and just obliterates the top part of the castle. Like it's just gone. Massive Ursa shock. It, it's important to remember, yeah, Kuma tends to use the pawpaw fruit for, um, you know, humanitarian needs like teleportation and like rejecting the pain and suffering out of people. Um, but the destructive power of this fruit is insane. Literally, one of the strongest moves is compressing a bunch of air and then releasing it at once as the Ursa shock. And, uh, yeah, it's basically like a large-scale bomb when that thing detonates, okay? So, he just uses that to obliterate the castle. And this day would go down in history as Sorbet Kingdom's one-man revolution. All right! Go, Kuma! I understand, Kuma, you're a bit of a pacifist, but every now and then... You know, you got to, you know, Superman, you know, land on the ground. You got to charge in and, you know, Ursa shock an entire castle. That's just how it goes sometimes. It's the One Piece world, man. This is not fair. Anyway, we cut to Marie Joie very briefly where we see Saturn in his chair of authority, in his room of authority. And uh, we have a messenger showing up. The messenger's hair, we only see the back of him, but the hair kind of looks like Foxy's hair. It's like that split kind of this uh, style that Foxy had. So, Silver, wait, wait, wait. Foxy the Silver Fox used to work at Marie Joie? Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Okay. This might make sense, all right? He fell from grace a while ago. No, so Foxy, actually, we do know his backstory. He used to be a professional boxer because the boxing league is a thing that exists in One Piece. There's an actual boxing organization. IDEO was part of it. It's a thing. Uh, but anyway, he got a, uh, he got banned from boxing because he was like uh, basically using weapons. I like to think that he was hiding like explosives or knives in his boxing gloves when he was fighting. You know, that, that was kind of how bo uh, a boxy, that's how Foxy went out. Uh, but yeah, there's an individual, looks a lot like him, okay? Well, anyway, he's like, uh, yes, uh, Saint Saturn. It seems that the Sorbet Kingdom in the South has a new king. And uh, Saturn and is just there and he's just like, hmm, and whom did the crown fall to? Hmm. So we're cutting back to the Sorbet Kingdom. People are recovering again. This is the second revolution they've been through, but you know, it's been a rough time coming, but it seems like everything's gonna be okay now. They're slowly rebuilding the castle. Everybody's cheering for Kuma. Like, Kuma, Kuma! And then it turns out that Kuma is lauded as the new king. 
everybody's calling Kuma the king. However, Kuma himself says, I, I'm not a king. I'm not like an actual king making policies and dealing with that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not a politician, as Kuma says. Um, I'm nothing but a figurehead. The uh, old king bulldog son, he is the one that's actually running the place. Okay, so... Um, it's always been mentioned that Kuma was the former ruler or tyrant of Sorbet. We'll get to where tyrant comes from in a moment. Um, as I expected, it's Bakori taking, you know, his, like, perspective on things, becoming uh, the global perspective on things. But anyway, yeah, so before Bakori, there was, you know, the king that came right before that. Uh, we don't know who that was. But before that king, so two generations back, was King Bulldog. And the old folks on the island remember him pretty fondly. They were like, oh yes, old King Bulldog. Yeah, he, he wasn't a half bad king. He was a lot better than Bakori, let me tell you. Um, you know, now when, when he was the king, we didn't really have a lot of mo much money to go around, but you know, our hearts were filled. You know, he was the kind of king that's like, not gonna overtax his, uh, his citizens. You know what I mean? It's just like, okay, Sorbet's not a very wealthy kingdom. Uh, you know, maybe they could barely afford to pay the, the heavenly tribute. Maybe they could just barely pay the heavenly tribute and then that's it. So the royal family during Bulldog's time probably wasn't that lavish, but that was okay. Like, Bulldog was okay with that because it, like, at least the citizens were happy, okay? Um, so they're talking about King Bulldog. We're gonna see him in a moment. Uh, meanwhile, we have Bonnie just running laps around the uh, the church because they're all still in the church. And remember, the church is all boarded up and everything like that. Bonnie's not allowed to leave. So we see Bonnie just running around, you know, like like uh, just working out in the church. Except she's an adult now. Like she looks as she looks right now in the story, like in her like early twenties. And so they have no like like the people in town are talking to Kuma about like the king and everything, and they're like, oh by the way, Kuma, who's this random lady that you have running around the church? She kind of looks like Ginny. And then that's when like they finally like they didn't notice her up until now, but then Kuma looks over and is like, wait, what what the hell are you talking about, lady run? Oh my god, Ginny! <laughs> I like to think for a moment, for the briefest of moments, like, they all probably thought, like, they're in a church, you know, where Ginny died. I like to think for a briefest of moments, they thought that was a legitimate ghost. Alright, that was, that was Ginny's ghost running laps around the church, like, ooh, I have returned! Like, oh god, no! <laughs> Ghosts are real? Ginny, I'm so sorry! <laughs> She's like, no, no, no. It, it turns out it is, in fact, Bonnie, who at some point, it is not explained how. And also, it's even mentioned specifically by everybody, like, how did this even happen? Uh, she ate the Toshi Toshi Nomi. So she ate the age age fruit, uh, grew into an adult, and she doesn't even know. She has to look into a mirror and be like, what the hell are you guys looking at? Oh, God, what? And so then she, you know, turns back into a child, and uh, one of the old folks has a devil fruit encyclopedia, so he's, like, looking at it. Hold on a minute. I have a devil fruit encyclopedia at my house. Just give me a click. It's like, all right, Mr. Kanker Schmidt. All right, Mr. Kanker Schmidt comes back. He's like, all right, let's do what we got here. And, uh, kage, kage, no me, no, no, jacket fruit, that's stupid, uh, ah, right, here we go, the Toshi Toshi no me, the uh, ability to change the age, uh, oh, I could become a nice strapping young man again, oh, that's cool, uh, yeah, she must have eaten that at some point, and, uh, <laughs> everyone's like, how? <laughs> She's been in the church the entire time, she never left, okay? So uh, they all kind of freak out. Um, okay, so a couple of reasons. I think this might be relevant, by the way. The fact that she just eats the fruit off, off screen, but it's also like while in the church. Okay, so with Devil Fruit Reincarnation, from how we understand how it works, I guess, uh, somebody in the world had the Toshi Toshi no Mi before Bonnie. That might actually come into being relevant. Um, they died and the fruit was reincarnated, and it must have just been reincarnated into one of, it had to be a fruit that was inside of the church, right? Because Bonnie's not allowed to leave, so she can't go outside to like, oh, look, a tree. Oh, there's a weird fruit growing on the tree. I'll just eat it. No, so it had to have been a fruit that like, like Kuma went out to get groceries and like, oh, Bonnie, I bought apples and then just put the apples on the table. You know, you know yeah, yeah, apples will cure sapphire scale. Just make sure to have one a day. And then Kuma walks away to go talk to the townsfolk. And then one of the apples, like, just like with Smiley and the axolotl fruit transform into a devil fruit. And Bonnie's like, 
ew, that sucks. <laughs> and then that's the Toshi Toshi Nomi. That had to have been it. Also, go back, going back to what uh, Vegapunk mentioned, not Vegapunk, but the, the Gorosei, kind of what the Gorosei mentioned, that certain devil fruits have wills of their own. I, I know they were referring to zones specifically, but who knows? If zone fruits have wills of their own, maybe Paramecias and Logias have wills of their own. And maybe that one was like, oh no, there's a, there's a girl in the South Blue that is deserving of the, this particular devil fruit because it will help her get stronger and save the world and hearken in the next coming of the sun god or some shit. I, I don't know. If devil fruits do have wills, maybe that happened in particular, okay? Um, but maybe, maybe not. But at some point, yeah, some of the previous user of the Toshi Toshi no Mi had to die, and the fruit, I guess, got reincarnated right there in the church. So was the previous user, you know, on Sorbet Kingdom or one of the surrounding islands? Who knows? But yeah, that's how Bonnie got the fruit. It's not really explained. Um, but yeah, it's also, by the way, at this time that she mentions that uh, the reason she's like running laps around the uh, the church is like, oh, well, by the time I'm 10 years old, I've decided I'm going out to sea, right? So I got to build up my strength and get stronger. It's like, okay, because by the time the Sabaody Archipelago happens that we get introduced to all the supernovas, Bonnie was 10 years old at that point. She's 12 right now with the time skip and everything. That's something I forgot about, you know, trying to factor in the time skip. But yeah, when Bonnie was like at Sabaody and, uh, you know, fighting all the Marines and everything like that, yeah, she was only 10 years old. So so, you know, the promise that she made to her dad, you know, I'm going to go out to sea at age 10, that, that does happen, okay? We know that much. At this point, they have visitors at the church. Uh, that's uh, Old King Bulldog and uh, his mother. Queen Dowager Connie. All right, so this is where this connects back to it because a lot of people were like, how does Connie connect into all this? So um, Bulldog walks in and, and he's a pretty old guy. He's the king from two generations back. So, um, you know, Bakori himself, I think is like in his 30s or 40s. So, you know, Bulldog, this dude might be like in his 80s or 90s at this point. He looks like a pretty old guy. The previous, previous king of Sorbet. And he walks in and he's just like, hey, where'd you have that? in here. Kuma, I gotta talk to you. He's like an old man. He's like, oh, hi, King Bulldog. How you doing? What? What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, anyway. Um, I come with dire news. Oh, I've seen you've already met my mother. And then you see Queen Connie, who's even older, because she is the uh, mother of Bulldog, who already looks like an old dude. He looks like in his 80s or 90s. So Connie might be like 110. It's kind of like that episode of SpongeBob with the chocolate. And she's like, Ma, you want any chocolates? Ah, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> you know, it's like that kind of stuff, right? Um, still, you know, an entire kingdom run by old people, like seniors and stuff like that, still better than Bakori. At least Bulldog is not actively trying to burn the city down, so it's like, all right, fine, we'll take it, right? Okay. So King Bulldog comes uh, bearing some rather harrowing news, but in the background you have uh, Bonnie and Connie. Uh, Bonnie is practicing her Toshi Toshi no Mi to grow older, and uh, Connie is there, and so basically Bonnie ends up modeling her old woman guys uh, you know, after Connie, you know, because like she's right in front of her and everything like that. So there's the origin of that. That's the reason why when Connie shows up, well, Bonnie shows up as Connie at Reverie, the guards recognize her. Like, oh, you're the Queen Dowager of Sorbet. So yeah, even to this day though, that also confirms Connie is still alive because Reverie that just happened in the story recognized Connie as like, oh, you're the Queen Dowager of Sorbet, all right? So I guess that means at least confirming that Bulldog is still the king of Sorbet right now. Uh, so at least nothing else horrible happened to it, probably. And then Connie is still alive. So they're all very old, but, you know, whatever. So um, Bulldog is there, and he's like, Oh, yeah, so uh, I, I come barrel, barrowing tidings, uh, uh, poor tidings, as it were. So uh, King Bakori... He, okay, I'm just going to cut the voice. Okay, here's the deal. King Bakori went... He didn't die. Kuma didn't kill him. He was able to escape again. And uh, this time he's plotting another comeback, okay? Apparently he beseeched the Marines and the world government. Uh, and like we said, the world government really loves this kind of stuff. We're just like, I tried to burn down my kingdom. It was my kingdom. I have the right to do that. And the world government is like, actually, you're right. And of course, Bakori spins the line that Kuma is a tyrant and he ousted him by force. I was, I was the rightful king of Sorbet. And then this random bear guy showed up and blew up my castle, you know? And so the Marines are like, 
like, all right, we'll help you out with that. So apparently, uh, Bulldog says that, you know, Bakori is building up a fleet to go back to Sorbet to take it by force. Three times the charm, I guess. Um, yeah, so you gotta give it to him. Like, with Wapple, at least, after Luffy bazooka Wapple off the island and he landed somewhere else and, you know, he lived in poverty for a little while, then he became the owner of a toy company, uh, and then, like, a multi, you know, multi million bellineer, belly, bellioneer, or whatever. At any rate, when Wapple became rich, he at least didn't try to take back drum. He was like, fine, I'm gonna build my own drum kingdom in the south with blackjack and hookers. You know, it's like, that's what Wapple kind of did, right? He didn't try to go back and fight Dalton. Um, and, you know, Bakori is like committed to it. He is just like, no, that is my kingdom and I'm taking it. It's like, all right. So we see uh, the newspaper, the World Economic Times. We see Kuma being announced as the evil tyrant. So that's the origin of that. It's just a total uh, smear job on the, uh, on the, on the uh, uh, hand of Morgans. Uh, Morgans probably was just paid. Is like, hey, this guy, Kuma, uh, kicked Bakori out of his kingdom. He's a bad guy. He's a tyrant. And Morgans was probably like, oh yes, that's big news. I, we can make that story look cool. You know, also the fact that Kuma is a revolutionary probably doesn't help his case very much. The world government doesn't care about him, honestly. So, um, he's going to be coming back to the island at some point. And, uh, you know, uh, Bulldog says, yeah, he has a fleet on standby from what I heard. And so the old folks are like, oh, no, not again. Oh, our heart can't take this anymore. You know, Kuma, you... I imagine at this point they're kind of looking at Kuma and they're just like, Kuma, like, um, we understand you're a pacifist and whatnot, but, um, could you just make sure to kill him this time? <laughs> like, uh, you know, the first time, all right, maybe we'll be okay. Then he came back and he burned the town down. Okay. And then you didn't kill him the second time. Like, maybe this time, just make sure, because this shit's going to keep happening, okay? So Kuma looks at them and he's like, no, 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 don't worry, I feel it. I, I feel the same as you guys do at this point, you know? It's like, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Fool me three times. I'll make sure he's dead this time. Don't worry about it, you know? So Kuma is like, all right. He's like, if he attacks... Uh, I'll do all that I can. Um, however, the thing is, he, he realizes, kind of looking into the future here, he's like, look, I'm already referred to as a tyrant. If he attacks again and I wipe his fleet out and I do kill him this time, I'm going to be branded as a straight-up criminal. I'm not going to be able to stay on this island anymore. The church is not going to be safe. This island is not going to be safe. I'm basically going to have to live as an outlaw. I'm going to have to basically go be a pirate, okay? And uh, the problem with that is, you know, Bonnie needs to be looked after, okay? Bonnie has this illness. And so King Bulldog and the Queen Dowager uh, Connie are like, Oh, don't worry about Bonnie. It's okay, Kuma. We'll, we'll make sure there's a room in the castle that no light can get into. We'll make sure she's protected, that she's safe. And Kuma's like, okay. Uh, and uh, picks up Bonnie and is like, you know, Bonnie... I'll be back as soon as I can. Just make sure to be a good girl until then. And Bonnie is just like, oh, you're leaving, Dad? Oh, okay, but it's okay, because when I turn 10, we could go on adventures. And Kuma's just like, yep. <laughs> just like, all right. So um, we, we see a very brief montage of this where Kuma just goes out to sea, and Bakori's there with a fleet of marine battleships, and Bakori has, like, the bandages. He's still all banged up from the last attack. He's not even healed completely from the last attack, but he's like, there he is, Marines! There's the son of a gun that took my island from me! Blast him into oblivion! Go and do it! And Kuma is just like... <sighs> How many times do I have to teach you this lesson, old man? You know, and so we don't see what happens. We just see Bakori yelling and shouting like, fire the cannons! And Kuma's like, oh, how dare you show your face here again? Well, I'll make sure you never show it again anywhere. Takes off his gloves, activates Ursa's shock, and um, I love how the narrator comes on and it's just like... Of course, Kuma sank the entire fleet. <laughs> like, it's just one panel. It's like, of course, Kuma devastated that entire fleet of marine ships. How many were there? There were, okay, there, we only see three on panel. There were probably a few more in the background, but we see three marine battleships. Kuma can sink that, no big deal. We do not know if Bakori's dead this time, but 
I mean, come on, Oda. This is a flashback. This is the one douche that should die. So it's like, come on now, right? It's like three times. It's the third time he's trying this shit, all right? So I'm assuming he's dead. Um... I don't know, maybe he'll show up. He shows up at Egghead. You know, he shows up at Egghead. Like, like you know, Bonnie is there, finally reunited with her dad after the past, after PX Zero lands on the island. He's all broken up and like, Bubba Bonnie, you know, I, I am your father, I love you. And like the robot is glitching out or something. And then at the last minute, at the last moment, Bakori shows up and he's like, I will stop you. Like Bakori is a cyborg now, he walks over. I have transformed myself into a cyborg, Kuma. You know, and just like, oh damn it, this guy. <laughs> All right, so yeah, um, after that, Kuma would go out to sea and he'd be branded as a pirate. We see his wanted poster, but we don't see the bounty. Eventually, he would end up with a bounty of like 296 million. I think he becomes a warlord shortly after this, so this bounty might be the 296 that he was given. At, you know, we see that the former bounty he had. Uh, his strength fueled his notoriety, which spread like wildfire, earning him a bounty. Uh, we see Sorbet, we see Bonnie there. She's obviously very sad that her dad is not, not, no longer around. And just like, Daddy, I miss you. And then Connie is just making her some cookies and just like, oh, it's okay, Bonnie, have a cookie. You know, I'm sorry, but you have to understand your dad has very very important work to do in the world. He's a he's a hero, Bonnie. He saved us all. And Bonnie is just like, you know, she's a child at this point. So she's like, well, yeah, that's great and all that my dad was a hero, but I, I, I don't get to see him anymore, you know? And it's like, I want to see my dad. And so Connie is like, oh, that's so sad, you know? Uh, he's like, well, it doesn't matter. When I turn 10, I'll be a pirate. I'll, I'll go out to sea too, just like my dad. I'll be a pirate. And Connie's like, all right, okay, dear. Well, let's, here you go. Let's go watch Columbo. <laughs> just like, yeah. Yeah. Bonnie is just hanging out with her grandparents <laughs> the entire time. Yeah. Oh man, that that brings back memories. My dad, um, my dad always hunted, you know, a lot, you know, when I was a kid growing up, and so I would always go to my grandparents in the morning, uh, you know, while my dad was out hunting. So I spent a lot of like weekends at my grandparents' place, and my grandmother would always make me like mac and cheese and stuff like that. And um, yeah, those are good memories. So meanwhile, uh, Kuma is going on a little bit of a quest, a Kuma quest, as it were. I think I'm gonna title the video that, Kuma Quest. One Piece, chapter 1099 review, Kuma Quest. Has a good ring to it, does it not? Yes, okay. So Kuma is traveling the world. I mean, he's, he's taking advantage of the situation he's put himself in. It's like, okay, if I attack Bakori, I'm, I'm wiping out a marine fleet. They're gonna brand me as a pirate, okay. But this is not so bad, actually, because while I was on Sorbet protecting Bonnie in the church, I. I couldn't really find a solution to her cure. I, I was in the church the whole time, but now I can go pretty much anywhere in the world. So I can travel the world and maybe somewhere in some far off land, there is a cure to this sapphire scale disease, right? So the first place he goes, because it's in the South Blue, we don't know a lot of locations in the South, but we do know the Torino Kingdom is in the South, the island that Chopper got sent to by Kuma during Sabaody. The place with the, um, they look like cavemen, like very primitive cavemen, but they're actually really scientifically advanced, and the birds and the giant tree and everything like that. So Kuma lands there and he's just like, ah oh, yes, uh, I've heard this island of Torino is uh, renowned for their medical uh, medical science and knowledge. And then, you know, the natives of the island walk out and then they're just like, oh, hello there, large bear man. I, ugh, this is ooh. And just like, Kuma's like, um, did I get the wrong island? Is this not the Torino Kingdom? Oh no, it is. Og is over there testing clinical trials to cure Amber Lead Syndrome. And then it cuts over and, and Og is there like in a doctor's coat running like IVs into his patients. He's like, yep, running clinical trial. <laughs> <laughs> just like, okay. Um, remember that show, Mike, Lou, and Og from Cartoon Network? That was the, the very short run show, Deep Cuts, but it was good. Um, so anyway, uh, he's explaining the condition Sapphire Scale and showing a picture of his daughter, of Bonnie, to the natives of Torino. And he's like, have you ever seen a disease like this before? Can you help me? And uh, the natives are just like, oh, she can't go in the sun? That awful. That's sad. We don't know disease. We can't help. And so Kuma's like, oh, all right, well, thanks for trying anyway. But And then he leaves. It's like, oh, by the way, can you help us with the birds, with, with the herbs? It's, oh, okay, he left. Oh, don't worry, Og. Someday a magical talking reindeer man will show up and save our island. 
I imagine they have like a mural of Chopper, like he's in their island's lore, like as their great savior one day. <laughs> he's gonna show up. Actually not, because when Chopper showed up, they tried to eat him, so yeah. Anyway, uh, Kuma travels to essentially all the islands he sent the Straw Hats to, which also makes sense because it's like, he can't send somebody to an island he's never been to before, you know what I mean? Like, so he's been to all these locations. The next place he's go he goes is Kuraigana Island, or Gloomy Island, where Mihawk would live, although I don't know if Mihawk is living there at this point. We only see one panel with him on Kuraigana. I don't really know why he went to that island in particular, because the story is that there was like a kingdom there that was ravaged by war, and uh, that was it. Like, the entire island was just wiped out by war, and, and sure enough, the only human living there by the time of the present was Mihawk, and then eventually Zoro and Perona for very briefly. Um, you have the human drills, and so that's it. So, I imagine Kuma landing on the island like, Is there anybody here? Anybody? Can cure my daughter's illness? And then, like, a human drill walks out like, Ook! It is like, Hi there, uh, baboon, can you help us? Oh, okay, and then they pick up, like, guns and, like, weapons and charge at Kuma, and he's like, all right, so that, that's going to be a no then? All right, <laughs> he pops himself away. Uh, we see a brief moment where Abdullah and Jeet, uh, the two uh, bounty hunters we get introduced to at Dressrosa that end up becoming part of the IDO pirates, they show up to fight against Kuma because they're bounty hunters, and Kuma has a bounty now. Uh, Kuma just... Ursa shocks their ship and just defeats them in one panel, so there you go. But we see Abdullah and Sheet again, so there we are. Um, he, next up, he goes to Baljamore. He goes to the future land, Karakuri Island. I imagine he went there because he heard about Vegapunk, and so Vegapunk, that's the island he grew up on, so maybe Kuma was like, ah, maybe there's somebody on the island that might, might not be Vegapunk, but maybe there's something that could help me. So he goes to the island and is showing everybody the picture, but nobody seems to be able to help. Uh, he's like, oh, yeah, no, see, Vegapunk doesn't live here anymore. He'd be able to help you, but yeah, he's not here anymore. Um, I heard he set up shop at a place called uh, Punk Hazard in the Grand Line, yeah. Um, and so maybe Kuma's like, well, this is the future land of Baltimore. Surely there's another scientist that could help me. Uh, well, there's Professor Tsukimi, uh, but he choked on a rice cracker a couple years back, and uh, yeah, he had a funeral for him. It was really sad. He made these little robot things that then floated up to the moon. Kuma's like, all right, so that's going to be a no. All right, well, thanks for trying. <laughs> so... That's actually canon, the, the professor who choked on it. That's, that's in Eneru's cover story. There you go. Um, he goes to Tequila Wolf. He doesn't really go to Tequila Wolf. He just kind of sails by the bridge, very much like how Odin, you know, sailed by the bridge. I'm, I'm glad they, they liberated Tequila Wolf. You know, it was like this for like 700 years, and we see it in Odin's flashback. We see it in Kuma's flashback. And then finally, when Robin was sent there, it was finally resolved. I'm, I'm glad the revolutionaries finally dealt with that. Um, he even goes to Weatheria. He goes up to Weatheria. He's like, Oh, look at this marvelous sky island. And he even talks to Haradus and just like, Oh, weather wizards of Weatheria, can you fix this illness? <laughs> oh, ho, let's see here now. Ah, yes, um, we're only good at the weather, I'm afraid. Uh, if you want us to create a tornado, we can do that. We can literally grow weather phenomena in bubbles out of the ground. But we're not very good at curing diseases, unfortunately. That's not... That's not our thing. You came to an island called Weatheria to get a cure to a disease. I'm, I'm sorry, but we can't help you. And the final place we see him go is he goes to the Boeing Archipelago where Heracles is, the place where Usopp got sent. By the way, if you would like to learn any additional information about any of these islands that Kuma's going on, well, I have the playlist for you. Geography is everything. Out now, everywhere. <laughs> I feel like one of those guys from like the 90s in like an infomercial like, Hey there, would you like to know about the geography of the One Piece world? Well, for only three simple orders of 500,000 berries each, you can have the Geography is Everything Complete Collection Edition in this collectible case. You know, we'll even give you a little coin as, as a token of our thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay, man, the 90s infomercials were great. 
Uh, remember Billy Mays? That was a little later, but I remember Billy Mays. R.I.P. Okay, so uh, he goes to the Boeing Archipelago. He talks to Heracles, and right, and Heracles, and actually, that's not a bad place for him to go, honestly. Like, where there he is, kind of like, what are you doing, Kuma? But Kuma's like, all right, here's a weird island, uh, plant life. Maybe there's some plant there that's rare that only grows on the Boeing Archipelago. And Heracles is a botanist. Okay, he was a botanist that went there with a, his own group of botanists years ago, and then they all died because the island is so, you know, ravenous, and then he stayed behind. He was the only one left to conduct his research, and then Usopp eventually shows up, right? So I can see that, actually. Like, oh, there's a bunch of weird plants on this, on these uh, archipelago, on the stomach barren. You know, is there anything that could cure sapphire scale? Uh, and so Heracleson is like, hmm, well, I am Heracleson. We have the giant uh, uh, food forest, the gourmet forest that provides food. And I'm sure Kuma at that point would be like, ah, oh, Ginny would have loved that. <laughs> Bonnie would have loved the, the gourmet forest too. Ah oh, man, maybe I can bring her here someday. Anything else? Um, well, there's also in the giant uh, insect forest in. It's like, yeah, that's not gonna help me. It's just like, hmm, well, unfortunately I can't help you, sorry. It's like, all right, well, thanks for trying anyway. You know, so, okay. Um, Kuma is remembering that, like, he's running out of time here. The, the years are going by. Granted, he can teleport, so it makes things a little easier. Not teleport exactly, but he can warp around the world easier than most people, right? But the years are ticking by as he's going to all these different islands. Uh, eventually, he runs across the Wind Grandma. The Wind Grandma is the fleet, uh, the the main flagship of the Revolutionary Army. It's Dragon Ship. So he runs into that ship seemingly by accident one day, and we get to see uh, almost all of the current members of the Revolutionary Army, like commanders. We see Bello Betty in her younger days. We see Morley is there at that point. Uh, we also see Gombo. Gombo is the vice commander of the South Army. We don't see Lindbergh. So it's possible Gombo might be the commander of the South Army, and then Lindbergh joined later, and then Gambo stepped down to be the vice commander because he's like, oh, Lindbergh clearly would be a better commander than I would, okay? Or it's possible that he is still the vice commander here, and Lindbergh might be somewhere else in the world on a mission. Uh, we also don't see Karasu, so Karasu could also be maybe not joined yet or somewhere else in the world on a mission or something, okay? Um, but yeah, so Dragon and Kuma, they share a good drink. It's been a while since they've seen each other, since Kuma quit the Revolutionary Army. Um, a dragon mentions that Ivankov and Inazuma got captured and got sent to Impel Down. So this is only like a few years. This is actually four years, we find out, before the um, current story, okay? Which means this is two years before Luffy left Fusha to go and be a pirate, okay? So we're getting very close to the end of the timeline here. We don't really venture into this part of the timeline too much, like a year before Luffy left or two or three years. You know, every time we usually do timelines, it's like usually a long time ago, right? So we're getting pretty close to the present here. But this is four years ago because Dragon mentions that uh, Vegapunk, you know, I wanted to tell you about Vegapunk earlier. The problem was he works for the government. He might be able to cure Bonnie, but up until now, his base of operations was Punk Hazard, which was this government facility in the New World. It was heavily fortified and uh, guarded. You, you couldn't easily get a meeting with Vegapunk, especially since you're a pirate after all now. You know, you're pirate, tyrant, king, revolutionary. You're just adding stuff to your resume, Kuma. And Kuma's just like, oh, people change. You know how it goes, dragon. Glug, glug, glug. It's good to see you again. Uh, oh, by the way, Bello Betty also brings up like, hey, Kuma, I was wondering, I want to be the new commander of the East uh, Division of the Revolutionary Army. Uh, can I do that? And Kuma's like, I'm not a revolutionary anymore. Why are you asking me for permission to be the commander of the East? And he's like, well, because Ginny was the former commander of the East, and Dragon would not let anybody take up that position unless you were okay with it. And Kuma's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, no, it's it's fine with me. You can go and do that. That's really nice of Dragon. I, I bet Dragon felt pretty bad about Ginny's death, you know, maybe because, you know, they didn't they didn't actually even try to go to Marie Joy. I, I understand why, but still, that would eat somebody up on the inside. Side. That'd be a lot of guilt. So maybe Dragon was like, yeah, I don't, I don't feel right making anybody the Eastern Army commander unless Kuma's okay with it, because that's like a position that, you know, Ginny had and everything like that. 
So that's how Bello Betty became the Eastern Commander. Um, but yeah, uh, he goes on to say, oh, you mentioned Sabo and Koala. They wanted to see you too. Our young revolutionaries are steadily becoming stronger. They've come a long way. You know, they're going to be the light that's going to illuminate the next dawn and all that kind of jazz, right? Um, as Kuma's, like, as he was traveling the world, he mentions, like, oh, I, a lot of times when I was seeing the place in the world, like the, the bridge in the east, uh, I was thinking about, like, what would Dragon do in this situation? You know, I really looked up to you, Dragon. I, I still do. I mean, he still does look up to him and everything like that. Well, anyway, um, yeah, Dragon says, well, like, look, you know, Vegapunk, usually it's hard to get a meeting with him, but there was an accident just the other day at Punk Hazard where Vegapunk's lab was destroyed, so he had to move labs to another island. That other island is probably not really that fortified right now. It's probably not guarded that severely, so you could... If there's ever a point where you could go meet Vegapunk, it would be now. So obviously they're referring to the moment when uh, Caesar detonated the, the explosive poison gas bomb weapon at Punk Hazard and then the entire island was ravaged and turned into a wasteland. Uh, there were multiple facilities on Punk Hazard that were destroyed. Only one was the one that survived, the one we see during the Punk Hazard arc in the Frozen Lands, right? Um, and so uh, to keep in mind, this is what Punk Hazard looked like originally. It was a jungle island. It had uh, fish and butterflies and flamingos. It was teeming with life, uh, and then one day Caesar, because he's Caesar, was like, ah, boom, psh, sets off a nuke, basically, and destroys most of the island, okay? So that was the point where Vegapunk moved his home base from Punk Hazard to Egghead, okay? And so this just happened the other day, which means, you know what this means, ladies and gentlemen, it means the whole series of events that led to Bonnie being cured to Kuma becoming the pacifista, that's all because of Caesar Clown. Because if Caesar would have never detonated the weapon, Vegapunk would have stayed on Punk Hazard, meaning Kuma might have not have been able to get a meeting with him, meaning Bonnie might have just straight up died. So Caesar's done a lot of messed up things in his life, but uh, oddly enough, in some weird timeline kind of way, he was able to save Bonnie's life. I'm not gonna thank him, because he's a dick, but you know what I mean, like, weird events end up like, even like the most horrible of events, like Caesar being so petty and jealous of Vegapunk to detonate a weapon that wipes out an entire island, uh, at least that ended up having some good at the end of it, in a weird way. Uh, but it also resulted in Kuma in the Pacifista project finishing up, so... Yeah, potato, potato at this point. He's like, all right, well, if that's the cure, I'm gonna go and check out every lead I can, so I'm gonna go see Vegapunk, uh, and then that's when Dragon says, go where the winds take you, my friend. And then so uh, Kuma heads off. Uh, he goes back to Sorbet to pick up Bonnie, obviously. Uh, so Bonnie's a little older now. Uh, so this would be four years ago. So Bonnie would be uh, eight right about now. So she's only got two years left until the disease is, like, time is up and she's going to die. So um, he goes back to Sorbet, Kuma. We see Bonnie defeating, uh, like, an older guy, like, a, like an adult, like, in combat. Like, she just beat the shit out of him. And just like, ha! And so he's on the ground like, oh, I went easy on her. He's like, I don't think he did. <laughs> I think he's just like, all right, let's fight. Oh, dog, God. Oh. He's like getting the shit beat out of him by an eight-year-old, right? So uh, Bonnie is, is pretty adept at fighting, absolutely. And so Kuma walks in. He's like, Daddy, you're back from the war. And just like, yeah, I guess, yeah, all right. So, okay, Bonnie, we're going to go to a special island where you're going to be cured. It's time to, you know, get your cure so you can go be a pirate with me, I guess, because that's, that's, that's the plot line now. And Bonnie's like, yeah. Yeah, okay. So they go to Navy Science Division Lab 8. So this is going to be Egghead in the future. It's not called Egghead yet. There's no giant egg on the island yet, right? So they go to this island. Sure enough, Kuma is able to sneak in with Bonnie. Uh, kept Bonnie in like a little barrel covered in a cloth so no light could get in. Uh, it had a little door on it so Bonnie like peeks her head out of the door like, oh, are we here? Oh, oh my goodness. He has a giant head. <laughs> and I was like, so Vegapunk, uh, this is four years ago, Vegapunk. He would be 61 years old. He has gray hair, but his head is still a giant light bulb shape. It's like the biggest we've ever seen it, right? Um, and so this is before the satellites. This is before the satellites are a thing. Pause that for a moment. We're going to get back to the satellites in just a second, okay? Well, anyway, um, 
Vegapunk looks at Bonnie. They have, like, their introductions and everything like that. You know, it's like, you know, oh, she has a spunky kind of attitude. It's just like, well, that's a little bit of that to get you through the, li the life, I guess. Anyway, Vegapunk mentions... I do have a cure. I can cure Bonnie. And Kuma's like, you can? And he's like, yes, I can, Quasar. I'm the greatest scientist in the world. Well, at least I would be if I could make a dragon blue. But I was like, whatever. Anyway, yeah, I could basically do uh, stem cell research and um, develop stem cells, give them to Bonnie. Uh, it, it's very complicated. It's genetics, lineage factor. I'm not going to bore you. Point is, I can cure your daughter of sapphire scale. The problem is, it's going to be a very expensive research project. A right about as expensive as making a cyborg. And Kuma's like, you're gonna turn her into a cyborg? Oh, heavens to Betsy, no. I'm not gonna turn her into a cyborg. I was just comparing the overall costs. Uh, however, though, um, uh, since we're on the topic of cyborgs and whatnot, I'm just throwing this out there. You're a buccaneer, correct? And Kuma's like, uh, yeah, I, I am. And he's like, ah, yes, and I, I know, you know, I'm a member of the government and everything like that, so why would you come to me? And Kuma's like, listen, um, number one, I trust Dragon with my life, and number two, I need to save my daughter. I'm willing to make a deal with the devil if it means I can save my daughter. So whatever happens to me as long as she's okay, right? And so, um... And Kuma does ask, though. He's like, hey, by the way, wh what's the big deal about me being a buccaneer? Like, the government, like, you know, captured my dad and killed him, and then me, when I was a kid, I was sold into slavery. Why, why is me being a buccaneer a big deal? And um, Vegapunk mentions, I don't have enough samples to explain in any detail. I haven't really had a chance to experiment or look at the, the lineage factor, the DNA of a buccaneer before. So Kuma's here now, though, so he's like, oh, I'll take some blood samples and I'll do some research. But also, he brings up I want to clone you, Kuma. <laughs> Just bear with me now, Quasar. I want to clone you. And then Kuma's like, what? He's like, yes, yes. So I'm going to clone you, make you into a robot. Actually, an army of robots. Are you with me now? And these will be robots for my clone soldier project. Almost like uh, clone troopers. But I'm fighting, the, uh, um, I'm fighting the copyright on that right now. But yeah, they're going to be clone robot soldiers that can fire laser beams. And so Vegapunk's like, yeah, if you allow me to do that, if you allow me to clone you, take your DNA, make you in an army of Terminators, then um, I'll waive the medical expenses for curing Bonnie. <laughs> By the way, in the background, Bonnie is, like, um, playing with Sentomaru. Like, Sentomaru is just, like, you know, the babysitter in the meantime. And Bonnie's, like, riding on top of Sentomaru's, like, giant battle axe, like like a pony or something. It's just like, hey, that's my battle axe! It's like, yay, it's a pony! It's just like, ugh. <laughs> that, that's kind of funny in the background. Um... So, uh, Vegapunk goes on to explain just the more details of the Pacifista, like they will have sturdy bodies, they'll deflect bullets, uh, they will be heroes that will protect, protect the weak and helpless of the world. And so, Kuma trusts Vegapunk here, because Vegapunk is being genuine. He does think that this project is going to save the world. He's going to help people, right? And he's like, are they going to be like Marines? It's like, ah, essentially, yes. They're going to help the downtrod, and they're going to be these invincible steel soldiers kind of thing, right? And so, um... Vegapunk mentioned, uh, I mean, Dragon mentioned to Kuma that he, he was rather ambitious and he was eccentric, but you are trustworthy. So Kuma is really going out on a limb here with Vegapunk. He's really kind of believing in Dragon's words here. Uh, Dragon said that, did he? Oh, he's always been a bit holier than thou. Um, but anyway, uh, Kuma agrees, though. He says, well, you know, I was willing to make a deal with the devil here. Like, you were going to ask for something really insane. But, um... You know, if it's just clo because remember, Vegapunk's not talking about turning Kuma into a cyborg here. At least I don't think he is. He's just talking about taking Kuma's buccaneer DNA, cloning him, making pacifistas, making the clone soldiers. He's not talking about taking away Kuma's memories, turning him into PX Zero or anything, right? So Kuma's like, you know what? I was willing to do some, you know, really horrible things to get Bonnie cured, but this might actually be my purpose. This might be my purpose to be part of this project to help save everybody all over the world at once with these uh, clone troopers, you call them. You know, clone soldiers. Yeah, yeah, copyright. It's like, oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. So, um... Vegapunk does mention Dragon probably won't be happy about this because I'm making soldiers for the Marines, but science, Quasar! Um, so anyway, he says, uh, you know, Kuma agrees to it. Vegapunk is like, fantastic, let's get to work. And then 
last scene we kind of cut to Marie Joie, where Saturn is there listening to this entire conversation via a black Den Den Mushy that's wiretapping the whole conversation in the lab. And Saturn is like, a weapon's worth is defined by how many people it can kill. Vegapunk is a fool for not making the most of this chance. Uh, it doesn't matter. I have my own ideas. The idea is that Saturn is Vegapunk's boss, and I knew he was going to get involved at some point, because obviously he's the godhead of scientific defense. So Saturn is going to arrive at the lab, probably, and he's going to be the one with the stipulation of like, alright, we're not only going to use Kuma's DNA to make these uh, soldiers. We're also going to turn Kuma into one, and, bonus, he's going to be a warlord. And Kuma, of course, is not going to like that, but he's like, I knew it wasn't going to be that easy. I knew it wouldn't be that simple. But Bonnie's going to be cured, right? Yeah. I was like, all right, then I'll do it. You know, that's probably how this is going to go now, right? Uh, the last scene of the chapter is uh, Vegapunk calling him a saint. You know, he's like, oh, you're such a saint, Kuma. And Kuma's like, oh, I'm not a saint. I'm just a spineless pacifist. And then Vegapunk is like, ah, keeping the peace, eh? Pacifist, eh? Hmm, that gives me an idea. I'll call the robots the Peaceful Fists. No, that doesn't work, right? Peaceful Fist. Saint, passy fist, passy fist, passy fista! It's like, okay, I guess that works, sure. And then that's the end of the chapter, no break next week. Okay, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happening in this one. Uh, Bonnie ate a devil fruit, King Bacori came back, not once but twice. Uh, we got to see Vegapunk in his um, in, in Egghead at the very beginning. So, some people have brought this up, and because Vegapunk mentioned using uh, stem cells to cure Bonnie, uh, basically making like a clone of her. Okay, listen, I'm not, not a biologist, not a doctor. Stem cells, that's when, um, wouldn't that entail basically cloning Bonnie? Not really cloning her, like an exact clone, but like taking Bonnie's lineage factor, making a clone, and then as the clone is in like the embryo phase or embryo stage of like development, taking the stem cells out of that clone and using them to cure Bonnie. Not a doctor, don't know anything about this. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to remember like high school health class right now, to be honest with you. You know, like that's, that's based like stem cells. That's what those are, right? Or trying to remember biology class right now. It's been a while since I've been in a biology class, okay? But that's what it is essentially, right? Now, people have brought up the female satellites like Lilith and York and Atlas, especially Lilith, they kind of resemble Ginny, which means they would also kind of resemble Bonnie a little bit. We don't know their hair color exactly. Like, if they all have pink hair, that's going to be kind of a, a giveaway. But, um, Vegapunk, this is only four years ago, and Vegapunk doesn't have any satellites yet. He still has his giant light bulb head, which means pretty soon he's going to slice off the top of his head and make the six satellites. What if he uses the, you know, lineage factor from Bonnie as a template, not a perfect template, not like an exact clone, but a template for Lilith, Atlas, and York? That's like a basic idea. Because especially if you look at Lilith and Ginny side by side, Lilith and Ginny, they, they kind of resemble each other a little bit. Um, there might be, because also Vegapunk, you know, when he makes the Seraphim, it's a bunch of DNA. It's like a DNA cocktail in the Seraphim. You know, it's King's DNA mixed with the Warlord DNA, mixed with Pacifista technology, with a little bit of Kuma, I guess. Bunch of stuff thrown into the, into the Seraphim. So, it might be something like that, where at least maybe some base uh, DNA or lineage factor in the uh, satellites might come from, from Bonnie or, or Ginny or something like that. I don't know. But, uh, that's the idea, essentially. So... Next chapter, chapter 1100, no break. I guess it'll just be out next week. We'll learn a little bit more about uh, Bonnie's cure, I guess, and uh, probably see how she gets... She'll probably get that little piercing in the next chapter because of that. We'll also see what'll happen to Kuma, you know, uh, of course, uh, turning into a PX himself and becoming a warlord, and Saturn's going to get involved, and this is, once again, it's like Kuma's life is kind of good when he was born, and then it was horrible, then it was good again, then it was really horrible, then it got even worse, then it was kind of getting better, and then in this chapter, it's like, ah, and then it's going to it's gonna shoot back down again. 
I have a feeling the flashback will end next chapter, though. I have a feeling that, like, it might be one of those things, like, we'll get half of the next chapter as a flashback, or, like, two-thirds of the chapter will be a flashback, and then at the end we'll cut back to Egghead, chapter 1100, see what's up with, like, the Straw Hats fighting against Saturn right now, see how that goes. Um, but yeah, that's chapter 1099. Moving on to 1100s, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for watching. This will be Teching signing out. I gotta go make a turkey. Yup. <laughs>